Today's show is brought to you by my friends at Underdog Fantasy. Underdog has gotten me back into daily fantasy football. I'm sure you guys have seen the screenshots going around of their live pick'em contests where you are picking anywhere from two to five player props, talking about over-unders on receiving yards, fantasy points, field goals, interceptions thrown, you name it. You are stringing together these bets, and if you hit all of them, you are going to hit on some crazy big payouts. If you go 5 out of 5, that is 20 to 1 odds. That's $2 to win 40 bucks on any given game that you want to bet on. And you can buy insurance so that you're allowed to miss on one of those as well. I have loved playing on Underdog Fantasy. Like I said, it has gotten me back into daily fantasy and helps me get more interested in any given football game that I want to watch. So I think you guys are going to love Underdog Fantasy. And right now, if you sign up using promo code TFG, they will also match $100 on your first deposit and you'll support this podcast, this channel, in the process. That is promo code TFG at Underdog Fantasy. All we've got to do now is to start pumping. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Fully Inflated Football Show after a week off we were diving into studs and duds last week so no show last week i do think that this show staying on wednesday is working for us and as we get into draft season i'm going to try to keep that rolling here uh so just wanted to get that out there today we are going to be talking about the coaching carousel for the upcoming off season going to be a ton of fun and we're going to recap the wild card games And yeah, welcome in. Excited for today's show. I do want to remind you that this podcast is made possible by my amazing supporters on Patreon. That is patreon.com slash that franchise guy, where you can not only support my channel, support my show in the biggest of ways, but become a part of this show by gaining access to the fully inflated mailbag through the DMs there on Patreon. I plan on doing a mailbag exclusive show later in the week, probably like Friday. So if you are on Patreon, get those questions in. If you do have a big question for me and you want to ask me, sign up on Patreon, get that question in here this week over the next couple of days. But another biggie is draft season is here. Going to be working up quarterback rankings and my first mock draft of the season over the next couple of weeks, but that also means film breakdowns, access to my draft board, and into April, team-specific seven-round mock drafts, the full TFG Draft Insider Package over there on Patreon. So if you enjoy my content, if you want to show your support and get even more content, head over to patreon.com slash that franchise guy. All right, so let's recap this weekend's excellent Really just round of games. I mean, the wild card weekend doesn't always deliver this many good games, and we got it. And I'm going to go in order of the games. And the first game wasn't so much a great game, but I think, you know, the Seahawks did keep us entertained. They played hard for Pete Carroll. Offensively, they did everything they could against that relentless Niners defense. Geno made some big throws. DK showed up. Uh, But at the end of the day, you know, Gino, a couple turnovers, which has become a theme with him. I I don't think it's um, too big of a deal. It it sounds like, you know, they're going to stand by Gino into next year, which I think is the right call, whether that's the franchise tag or a contract extension. Uh, The reality is they got to put a better defense around him so that he doesn't have to press so much. Like, yeah, he might be a quarterback that's prone to some mistakes, but I think in a lot of these situations, he's making a, a lot of big throws that he might not normally do if. He doesn't trust his defense to make a stop, right? So um, I I think that's really the biggest takeaway here in this game is how big of a mismatch this was. We looked at this on paper coming into the game, and that's exactly how it played out. I mean, for the Seahawks, they put out their bottom three defense in the NFL, and and that's in a year where the Houston Texans and Chicago Bears are trotting out what they were doing. And uh, especially in this game, I mean, one of their better players, who I'm not even crazy high on, But Jordan Brooks was out in this game, their linebacker. So you look at the way the Niners try to attack people, 
and where the the Seahawks are weakest, it was just a, a clash of of problems here for for Seattle. You know, the Niners want to run the ball outside. They want to attack the middle of the field, crossing routes, play action, and that area of the field. Whether it's the edge rushers containing the edge, whether it's the linebackers, strong safeties, slot corners, getting sideline to sideline and tackling and covering in that area, it was just a huge problem. The biggest problems for the Seahawks in this game was, of course, Jordan Brooks being out did not help as far as those big runs and the inability to tackle. But you got Ryan Neal as their strong safety or just all around safety who had a great season. Shout out to Ryan Neal. Steps in as a backup, fills into Jamal Adams' role, but he goes right back to looking like a backup in this game. Gives up a big touchdown through the air, misses three tackles, looked like a backup out there. So some of the execution here was just horrible. You have Cody Barton, the other linebacker. He comes out and misses three tackles. Tackling had been his biggest strong suit this season. He had only missed eight all year. And then he comes in and misses three in this game. Um, You've got Kobe Bryant in the slot, who Seahawks fans love. But I've been saying, like, he is not exactly a starting caliber player at this point. He's been getting picked on in coverage all year long. Did nothing special for them in coverage in this game. But he has been pretty good against the run this year. And in this game, on just 27 snaps, missed three big tackles. So this team just could not run and chase with these ridiculous Niners playmakers. They're the rack bros. It's what they do, but you need talent to match that. And the players we just rattled off are undrafted guys, backups, day three picks, not to mention the edge rushers did nothing in this game. Uchenin Wosu had a good game against the run, but beyond that, you got Bruce Irvin, who's, I think, my grandpa. You've got, um, you know, Boye Mafe, Daryl Taylor really struggling against the run in this game. All those guys providing nothing as pass rushers. It, it was just this defense stinks. They got to get back to the drawing board. You're obviously happy that you hit on Tariq Woolen. That's great. You hope Jamal Adams can come back healthy for them next year, but they have got to add some talent to this team. They're going to have a lot of avenues to do that. And if they can improve this defense, continue to build upon what they established offensively this year. The Seahawks can be back here on wildcard weekend next year. Um, uh, an excellent season for them, but let, let's be honest. The, the Lions or the Packers would have been uh, a better team uh, to come out here and, and play against the Niners because they just they ran out of steam as the year went on. They, they barely beat the Rams last week, right? So, you know, I, I don't really have a ton to say about the Niners. I, I do think the matchup helped this turn into this explosive game. Uh, They have, obviously, just this wave of momentum right now. They feel unstoppable, right, because they just no one's been able to beat them. I I do think, you know, they're going to be challenged a little bit more defensively uh, in the upcoming games. Dallas will be another good test. I do think they match up well at Dallas. Uh, But these playmakers are all hot and healthy right now. We we saw the explosive run after catch. Kittle is playing the best football of his career right now. Uh, Debo has another just incredible run so reminiscent of his big play against the bears last year where he he just catches a screen makes like four guys miss and he's off to the races for a touchdown he's insane Ayuk was great in this game uh other than um the dropped touchdown on it's so ironic you know um i think purdy left some Ayuk yards on the table early in the game with a with a missed throw and then later in the game uh purdy makes his best play of the game back corner of the end zone, like a Rogers Mahomes esque play extension type of thing. And Ayuk lets it go right through his hands. So a little bit of, you know, trade off there, but uh, I thought Ayuk was getting open and providing problems for the Seahawks defense. Uh, and then Christian McCaffrey, just kind of the final piece dropped into this. Um, just oh, it's so fun to watch this offense, man. And uh, I, I do want to talk about Brock Purdy before we move on to our next game. You know, there's a lot of, Tom Brady, Joe Montana comps coming out. And I I think Purdy's playing really well. And it's funny. This is always how things go with me because I tend to, you know, be a little bit more level headed, I think, about a lot of this stuff. I'm not going to rush out the gate to have these crazy big takes. Like, I freaking loved Brock Purdy coming out, right? Like, you can go back to my draft analysis. 
I said, totally take him on day three of the draft. He's a plug-and-play backup. I said he could be Case Keenum right away. He's got the experience, the composure. I love the way he moves in the pocket. He has good improvisational skills, even though he doesn't have a cannon for an arm. I even made parallels to his game to Jimmy Garoppolo. So based on my draft analysis of him, it is no surprise that he has stepped in and played well, and he's played better than Case Keenum for sure. Um but not like astronomically better. I mean, Case Keenum, remember, took the Vikings to an NFC championship with a really good team around him. So I don't think that's a crazy thing to say. Uh, Purdy, I, I just, I love the composure, though. That is really what is impressive for him as Mr. Irrelevant, the third string quarterback to come in and he's just not phased by anything. I think that's the biggest thing. Like he's totally calm to take a check down when it's appropriate. He can scramble and improvise. And then he brings that really nice baseline of getting these playmakers involved. And he's totally good enough with this team to win a Super Bowl with the best defense in the NFL and all these playmakers. And then, oh yeah, Kyle Shanahan, who's just pulling all the strings, who I think has elevated his play calling. Um, I'm not going to say he got stagnant with Jimmy G, but I think when he gets down to his third string, he really has to, you know, dig deep into his bag of tricks. And I think we're seeing that really scheming these, these guys open well. So everything's working for San Francisco. Do I think Brock Purdy is the next Steve Young, Tom Brady is going to be a, you know, starter for the next 15 years in San Francisco and that they should trade Trey Lance. I, at this point, I still don't think so. I, I, we were having conversations. I was in Vegas this weekend. I had a great time and watching this game and we were talking about it. I'm just like, wait, they don't have to trade either of these guys. Actually, Trey Lance doesn't exactly have the leverage to demand a trade at this point, heading into year three. You don't have to trade Brock Purdy. So maybe you do just bring these guys both back. I, I really still think a Trey Lance trade is pretty improbable. If Brock Purdy goes on a crazy run and they do win a Super Bowl, it's possible. But he, he, the thing is, like, they made this big move to get Trey Lance because they wanted to get out of the Jimmy Garoppolo deal where there's a, a certain ceiling with that. I think once you uh, remove yourself from the emotion of this and... Um, realize how good the surrounding situation is. I still don't think you just give up on a really athletic, toolsy quarterback that maybe in year three, you know, Trey Lance is still younger than Purdy, right? So, like, he's definitely played a lot less football. So, you know what I'm saying? Like, do you really just go right back to the guy with the weak arm where the play calling's got to be perfect? You got to have these playmakers healthy. I don't think so. And I think I think they're level-headed about that as well. They've seen all these guys come through and produce in this offense. But a tip of the cap for, for Brock Purdy playing as well as he has. Let's move on to the next game. Probably the craziest game of the weekend. The Chargers at the Jags. <sighs> What's the old saying? Chargers going to charger? Well, the Chargers absolutely chargered this game away. Bad. Really, really bad. The entire second half was... It, 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 you know, people say you can't this, the saying, another saying you can't make this stuff up or you couldn't write it in a book. I think that saying gets overused because there's situations like this where, yeah, you actually could write this. You could make this up and know that the chargers were capable of doing pretty much exactly this in the second half. They go into the two minute warning of the first half with a 27 nothing lead. And a lot of that was defense. Lawrence was making mistakes, turnovers, setting up short fields, and they got out early. They've done this a million times. But in the second half, the offense was anemic. They do fire Joe Lombardi, thank God. This was all year long, right? Ineffective runs, overusing the screen game, not letting Justin Herbert push the ball downfield. They've basically turned Herbert back into the check down merchant that he was at Oregon, and I hate it. But in the second half, that's exactly what happened. There was no aggressiveness. They completely folded. They get three points in the second half. By the way, they miss a field goal. That has been the Chargers' Achilles heel for years, going back to like 
mid Phillip Rivers days. And that field goal was a huge difference in this game. They have a busted coverage defense in Brandon Staley's zone-heavy split safety defense where Zay Jones is wide open for a touchdown. Like That's a big part of allowing these, these quick comebacks. Like just don't If they don't give up big plays, chew the clock down. Completely chargered this game away, a complete disgrace. And there, it's like this overhanging cloud of doubt within the organization that they can ever get things done. And they don't have that confidence that they can finish things because they have so many memories of this shit. So they just can't get that monkey off their back. Uh, Herbert's going to enter the fourth year of his career now without a playoff win. That's a, that's a travesty. And this was not a game that I would put on Justin Herbert. It's just really what they ask him to do. And he's so, he's playing so conservative. Everything's short of the sticks. It feels like if it's beyond the sticks, it's an intermediate back shoulder or something. It's just not any explosiveness here. And of course, you know, Mike Williams, not in this game because Joe Staley makes a moronic decision to play him. Look, if you got to play your starters in week 18 because you think you got a good thing going and you you want to compete and keep it rolling. I understand that logic. I think teams that have a bye week or do that kind of stuff are at risk of coming out flat. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes it does. But don't play Mike Williams, who can't get through three games without hurting his ankle or his back, who's already dealing with a lingering back issue. What the fuck are you doing, Joe Staley? Like That very well cost them. may have cost them this game because they weren't able to push the ball downfield, didn't have that big go-to target in some of those big have-to-have-it situations late in this game. Um, I, I think this is a situation where the offensive coordinator is a reasonable scapegoat. I hate what they did offensively. Um, but Brandon Staley deserves a ton of criticism for how this season ended. With Mike Williams, that playing out the way it did, and with the defense just collapsing at the end of this game. It's supposed to be a dominant defense. You've got Bosa. You've got Khalil Mack. You've got pretty much everybody out there defensively other than J.C. Jackson, and you're just folding in the second half. So now they played great in the first half. Asante Samuel's a fucking monster. Love that guy. He was all over the field. That was one of the better cornerback games you'll ever see. But, uh, yeah, just ugly on the Chargers, and I just, I'm sorry, Chargers fans, that you have to go through something like this every year. It's it's a different kind of pain uh, that the Chargers fans have to, to endure. It really is. It's not like, you know, the Jets or the Browns or the Lions where you're kind of used to failure and expect expecting a, a totally bad season. It's more like, no, there are expectations there, but they can't even, you know, it's it's also not like, like the Packers or the Ravens or the Steelers types of woes where at least those teams occasionally win stuff, right? The Chargers are just totally stuck in mediocrity uh, or like a, a step above mediocrity. Anyway, for the Jags, it's on now. It, it is fully on, not just for the playoffs, but really into next year. You, I think, saw Trevor Lawrence play free. And I do think there's been a little bit of just occasionally he's just uptight, can play a little close to the belt, a little conservative, doesn't always have a ton of swagger about him, kind of that golden boy, number one overall pick. Everyone expected him to always be winning. I think he's been kind of discovering himself uh, both with his personality and as a leader um, you know, coming out, there was the story about how, like, if things don't work out, it's going to be fine. Like, I'm happy with where I'm at at life. And then people are like, oh, does he care about football? This dude clearly cares a lot about football. He was fired up in this game. No one on that field wanted it more than Trevor Lawrence. And uh, it was a big part of the comeback, man. He just kept firing. He made a ton of mistakes in the first half. Four interceptions. Granted, uh, a lot of those weren't on him, but... Uh, really just didn't play well in the first half, but he he came out and was did this not just feel like one of those Tom Brady comebacks where it's just relentless? Um, it's kind of hard to explain, but it, Tom Brady is just throw after throw after throw. You know, I think some like 
Rodgers, Mahomes, Josh Allen compacts. Sometimes it's like two or three ridiculous throws, big plays that like get them back into the game with Brady and what we saw from uh, Lawrence in this game. Much more like methodical, picking you apart, stepping up to the plate, hitting a single or a double every single time. And that's that kind of is what I think of with with when he's at his best game is being that surgeon from the pocket. And, and that's really what this came down to. And it, it was just so fun to watch. So it's it's on for him. Like, he was supposed to be the next Andrew Luck, the guy that can save any organization. Here he is in year two. He's won a playoff game. He's got already got a crazy playoff comeback. Everyone obsesses about those. So, like... The, the sky is the limit for him. I think this Herbert Lawrence debate is going to become a very real thing um, because I do think, you know, Burrow this year has probably kind of made it tough to have a Herbert Burrow debate, at least for now. And we're always going to look for these debates. Lawrence and Herbert, I think, is going to become a very real conversation very quickly, especially with Lawrence. I mean, the play calling's really good here. They got uh, Ridley coming in next year. Their future looks very bright, and it's not just the offense. You know, defensively, Trayvon Walker had a, had a great game in this one. Five pressures in a sack. Uh, my dude, got to shout out my dude, Falarenzu Fadukasi, who was really a ghost all season, a big free agent signing. I was supposed to kind of clog up the middle. He was great against the run, and um, you know, he blew up. He got in the backfield on that play action uh, in the late in this game that helped create a second and 17 um, that really set up the the game ending drive there for the, for the Jags. But like the Jags are looking up. I, I don't think they, I don't think it's impossible that they can beat the chiefs. It's, it's not likely certainly, but they're playing with nothing to lose at this point. Their season was done long ago. They've now won a playoff game. Like, this, this could get very interesting into the next couple of years for the Jags. And just Chargers, I just don't know when this is going to change. I really don't, um, unfortunately. So the next game is Miami at Buffalo. And Josh Allen is just hilarious. <laughs> um, his seven huge big-time throws in this game. Literally, PFF, seven big-time throws. An average depth of target of 16 and a half yards. He was playing YOLO ball out there, and it worked. They put up 34 points. They had some huge plays in this game, and he's incredible. But his play is also the reason this was a close game as well. Um, He has three turnover-worthy plays in this game. He has a sack fumble, two sack fumbles, actually. One gets returned for a, a touchdown. Two interceptions, one of them not his fault. He takes 11 sacks in this game. And it's just like, (laughs) I think Bills fans are are tired of me bringing up the turnovers and the turnover-worthy play crap with Josh Allen because a lot of times it does not matter, right? He does this against... um, I think it was the Bears earlier in the in the year. He does it here today. A lot of times it doesn't matter because yeah, he's making seven big time throws. He does incredible shit. They still put up thirty four points. But the reason the Dolphins had thirty one, and you needed to convert a third down late in this game to make sure that you didn't lose this game against the Dolphins with Skylar Thompson. The reason that they were in this game is because of those turnovers. The Bills had 423 yards of offense to the Dolphins' 231. They almost doubled them up on offense. The reason the Dolphins scored is because Josh Allen was turning the ball over. So if you think you're holding the Bengals or the Chiefs to 230 yards of offense, good luck. You know what I'm saying? And... Like, he was incredible in this game, and in a weird way, he was the reason they won. I don't think it's a situation where you can put in Kirk Cousins or Andy Dalton and they win this game. But the volatility there is ridiculous. And I've been talking about this all year, about how he's had too many turnovers, and 
how in last year's playoffs, he wasn't doing this, right? He was much more methodical, wasn't putting the ball in harm's way, went on that incredible run. He's not playing like that right now. He's playing a little over the edge. And it's not that big of a deal, but if they want to win a Super Bowl this year, they are playing with fire with this game plan. I think they got to run the ball better. I think they got to find a way to get the short passing game kind of reestablished. You know, like you've got a couple running backs out of the backfield that are really good. You got Dawson Knox. You don't have a great, you know, ensemble of slot guys, but you've got Isaiah McKenzie, Cole, Cole Beasley's in there now. Stephon Diggs can operate in the short game. Like, just think a little bit, you know, of consistency would be really nice to see from this Bills team moving forward. Definitely played with fire in that game. Um, I also, you know, defensively, they're dealing with so many injuries in the secondary right now. Obviously not having Von Miller has hurt that pass rush, but I do got to shout out Tremaine Edmonds, who has really become a serious weapon for that defense. And, you know, coming out, he 20 years old at a linebacker position that how many times have I talked about how long it takes a lot of these linebackers to develop and learn the position. He's in his fifth year, (laughs) Tremaine Edmonds. He's in his fifth year in the NFL. He's, I don't even think he's 25 years old yet. (laughs) It's insane. Um, He's coming up on a contract extension, probably from the bills. It's going to be a lot (laughs) to be honest. I don't know if it'll quite be Roquan money, but it might be, but He is the ideal three-down, three-way linebacker where he's been really good against the run. His range and speed and length is such a a different problem that it presents for opposing offenses. It reminds me a lot of Brian Urlacher back in the day. He was 6'4 and fast and those big Spider-Man arms over the middle of the field where just the reaction time, the ability to get get his hands on balls. And he can he can blitz, too. He's a really good blitzer. So he was great in this game. He had an awesome pass deflection, which definitely, you know, teetered on the line of being a illegal contact. I thought he did lead with his helmet, but either way, it was a great play by him to uh, break up a, a pass to the flat to the running back. But, yeah, he, he's turned into a monster. But for the the Dolphins, I I really don't have a whole lot to comment on. I I think they gave it their all. They had 14 different defenders in this game, had at least two pass rush snaps. So they were bringing the house from every direction they could think of. They definitely were just playing aggressive. They were trying to create. Like, I love the game plan. They know Josh Allen has a tendency to put the ball in harm's way, just make him uncomfortable, create chaos, speed up his processor and hope for the best and it, it it almost worked like they get a defensive touchdown they shut they set up a bunch of field goals with with turnovers and then offensively they did their thing honestly without three drops in this game the dolphins probably win this game like a big drop from waddle a big drop uh from tyreek right so like to circle back to the bills for a second this is why I talk about the turnover-worthy play stuff and the tendency to put the ball in harm's way and why that stuff matters. I already said, 230 yards for the Dolphins, 423 for the Bills. If the Dolphins don't drop a couple balls, the Bills might lose this game because of the turnovers. And they were turnovers that were on Josh Allen. So that's really all I have to say about this game. The Dolphins built something really special this year, and the wheels fell off, right? Like they gotta f- they gotta have a baseline of quarterback play that isn't Skylar Thompson. And unfortunately, the two guys ahead of them just they can't rely on them right now, whether that's Tua or Teddy Bridgewater st- to stay healthy. So is this a Jimmy Garoppolo destination? Is this a sneaky Tom Brady destination? I don't know. They that will be a fascinating thing to see is is how do they feel about that quarterback room? It's not that Tua can't play. It's can he stay healthy? And I I don't know an answer for that question right now. Okay, the Giants at the Vikings. 
definitely a candidate for a game of the week. And Giants fans, I'm just asking you, can we please be friends again? I cashed a big ticket in Vegas. I picked you guys to win. I've been the last month, I've been talking up the Giants saying how they've passed the eye test in the last month, right? And this was the destination that I've been talking about. Like they are have become a very real playoff team. And you can point to the record and all this stuff and say earlier on in the year, like they were doing this and they were doing a little bit of this stuff. But this is a real team for a different variety of reasons. Number one is the defense is healthy. You've got a Dory Jackson back out there. You've got McKinney back at safety. Aja Lari's out there now. Not not full time, but he's been an impact. Uh, and then Saquon is healthy again. So I was mocking this team from October through November. They had a seven week stretch where they didn't beat a non Houston Texans football team, right? Like, that is not this version of the Giants. This version of the Giants is a real team. Oh, and by the way, Isaiah Hodgins has emerged as a much-needed number two option in the passing game. And you guys know how much I love Isaiah Hodgins. Seeing him play like this just warms my heart. He's one of my favorite guys in that draft class. Uh, Never should have fallen as as much as he did. But I just I want to be friends again, Giants fans. I do. And I think if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably cool with that. But uh, how about Daniel Jones as well? Like, I I don't know how far this goes, but he was it was the first time I've truly watched Daniel Jones, and and I've I've given him credit even before this year happened. I said, you know, he doesn't get enough respect. Like he's he's a solid NFL quarterback. I think I ranked him like twenty first coming into the year. Most people said that was too high. The, the narrative on him was he's a lost cause and basically a backup caliber player. And I was like, no, no, no. He's, he's you know, much better than that. I don't know if he's like the future. I don't know if I give him a contract extension, but I think he's better than that. But even when I was saying that about Daniel Jones and even like throughout the majority of the season, I haven't really spent a lot of time talking about Daniel Jones because I think he's played – like that guy that I was talking about. Like, he's been fine this year. But the last few weeks, and especially in this game, he's actually been, like, kind of dangerous, kind of scary. And he's reached a new level and a new comfort level as a quarterback because he's got a good arm, right? He's pretty good at reading defenses. He's been probably the best quarterback in the NFL at avoiding mistakes. I mean, that was his rookie season, the fumbles, the the turnovers, it was every week. I had a joke of, you know, I had a running joke on Twitter. This week's Daniel Jones, you know, the, the Daniel Jones turnover of the week, this week brought to you by insert defensive player. That was Daniel Jones early in his career. So that's been cleaned up. And now I think this staff, in a similar way that they allowed Josh Allen to get comfortable it's such a more modern staff that they're like, Danny, like if it's not there, run, go. Like there's no need to sit in there and get to your third or fourth progression when your third or fourth progression, especially is Kenny Galladay or even like Darius Slayton or like, you know, your legs are one of the best weapons we have. Let's use them. And they have totally allowed him to do that. And I think, That has gone hand in hand. Not only has that allowed him to run more and create a weapon that way, but I think it's made him more comfortable in the pocket and more confident as a passer. And I think it's definitely helping the turnovers because a lot of those fumbles that we used to see from him were blindside hits, standing in the pocket too long, not moving. He's a different player. So I'm not going to like rank him right now or whatever. We got a lot of that ahead of us, but he's going to be back in New York, no doubt. And I think what he's done is is made it so he's actually going to get a legitimate contract extension, not just the franchise tag. I could be wrong there, but I think we're looking at probably three years, a little north of 100 for Danny. Like three years, 105, three years, 110. Maybe it's even two years. 
Maybe he bets on himself a little bit. But I actually, I think that's fine. I think he's played excellent this year. And now he's won a playoff game. And he's won a playoff game. He did a lot of the dirty work in this game. He really did. So, I mean, he he totally outplayed Kirk Cousins, right? You know, Kirk was good in this game. But Danny was was pretty special. Um. <laughs> I did watch this game a little bit thinking that Dave Gettleman's getting the final laugh. <laughs> you know, we, we were really hard on Dave and he gets fired. This is mostly Dave Gettleman's team, right? Daniel Jones, a quarterback. You got Saquon Barkley killing it out there. Dexter Lawrence has turned into one of the best defensive players in the league. Myself and many people mocked him for that draft. You know, he was known for overvaluing defensive tackles in the run game. But that's kind of what this team is built on. Uh, you've also got Andrew Thomas, who he drafted as the first tackle off the board in that class. Great again in this game. Leonard Williams, Dory Jackson. Those are all Dave Gettleman guys. So, look, I think it was right to move on from Dave Gettleman, but... Maybe if Dave had a coach like Brian Dable, they could have built something special. I, I don't know. And, and maybe Dave deserves uh, another shot. I, I don't know. Here I am defending Dave Gettleman. Never would have thought it. Um, that's all I got on the on the Giants. Like I, I think this probably ends with the Eagles. They're, they're a feisty team, though. I think it's going to be a good game against the Eagles. Jalen Hurts has got a lot to prove here in the playoffs. So I guess we'll... We'll see how that goes. Oh, my mouse just died. Hang on, give me one second. But then for the Vikings, definitely a team that ran out of steam late in the year. The offensive line injuries were big. And a team that's just, you know, their close game win percentage definitely caught up to them, right? Like, we don't need to dive back into that. They were, they had won the most one-score games in NFL history. It was destined to come back to the mean at some point. They just weren't as good of, as their record showed. And it caught up to them in this game. The Giants kept getting better as the year went on. The Vikings stayed the same. And four weeks ago, Vikes beat the Giants in a close game. Here we are. The Giants kept getting better. And they outplayed the Vikes. Let's make no mistake about it, though. This loss is on Ed Donatel, Vikings defensive coordinator. I don't need to spend a whole lot of time about it. The Vikings fans know the problems. If you're listening to this podcast, you've probably seen my video on Vic Fangio defenses. If you haven't, just watch it. <laughs> it could not better describe the problems the Vikings have. The soft zones, the light boxes, playing defense like you don't want to actually play defense. And it's a sad way to play defense. It's a pathetic way to play defense. I hate it. And... uh as a Packers fan whose team is standing by Joe Barry, I just want nothing more than the Vikings to bring Ed Tonatel back so that we can die in agony against the Lions together with these horrible defensive coordinators. You know, I think the guys running the show in Minnesota are smarter than that. I think Quessy and O'Connell are going to take a look at this. I don't think it's out of the question for them to fire Ed Donatel, but the way that they spoke about him, they... I think we'll probably give him a second chance with, you know, they'll look at it and say he didn't have the talent. Uh, Because the secondary was not great, let's be honest. The secondary has a lot of issues. But that's, if you're talking about the Vikings being a regression candidate next year because they, because of the close game thing, I think their way out of that was going to be changing things up defensively. And they're bringing Ed Tonatel back or if they do, it doesn't bode well for them, in my opinion. I I think, yeah, that's all I'll say on the defense and that it, it will be an interesting offseason to see kind of how they, how they look at this thing. Because when they inherited it, they inherited the team, a brand new staff. There was a debate on, like, do you trade Kirk Cousins? Do you tear this thing down? They took the competitive rebuild approach, and that definitely worked out for them. It was a good year. They established a lot for themselves. But how do, how do they view this thing 
really with Kirk Cousins is is my where I'm getting at with this because the game ends and Kirk played well in this game, but with the game on the line, fourth and seven, fourth and eight, whatever it was, the man takes a check down. And it, it is a cut and paste Derek Carr moment from last year's playoffs. And when Derek Carr threw short of the sticks on fourth down, I told Raiders fans at the time, this embodies his play. You will never get further than this moment because of that. At some point, you're going to be in playoff football. You're going to have to put your balls on the table, extend a play, push the ball downfield. And even though all year, all year last year, Derek Carr looked like he was doing that better, all year this year, Kirk Cousins looked like he was making big plays under pressure. But when it mattered most, he throws it short of the sticks, tackled short, season over. And a year later, here we are, the Raiders, disappointing season. Derek Carr never played better than an average baseline, and they're looking for a new quarterback. Do the Vikings, I doubt they're going to do this, but do they try to speed up that timeline, knowing that that is a very potential end to next season, is that they're ready to move on from Derek Carr. So do they, are they, what I'm saying is, are they a sneaky, like, Anthony Richardson team that could maybe invest in a project as like a first round pick trade up, you know, like when the Vikings or sorry, when the chiefs moved up to get Patrick Mahomes, could they be a sneaky team to get a little aggressive for a quarterback here? It, it's something to think about for sure. All right. Baltimore at Cincinnati. Uh, kind of a weird game to break down, right? Like, the Bengals, it feels like all that matters right now is getting Lamar back because, sorry, the Ravens. feels like they gave it their all. The defense is obviously in a really good spot. They have they essentially held the Bengals to 17 points. Like This feels like it's going to be a championship defense next year with another year of, of Ojabo to get healthy, Owe. You've got Travis Jones playing well, Matabuike. Like, this defensive line is really the last piece for this team. Maybe another piece in the secondary would be nice at corner, but for the most part, like, they're right there with this defense. But offensively, they can't win a playoff game with Tyler Huntley. That much was very clear. He held them back in this game. Just can't, they just can't move the ball downfield. And I think we all know the Ravens win that game with a healthy Lamar Jackson. So this takes us to really three, a three-legged conversation. Number one being, should Lamar have played in this game? Number two is, are they going to work this out and get Lamar Jackson back? And then number three is, what does that mean with this whole Greg Roman conversation? I think it's time to have that conversation again. Number one, should Lamar have played in this game? I think there's a lot of jumping to conclusions going on and a lot of people that just feel like they need to have a take on this. You know, I think. do I think Lamar could have trotted out there and played at 75%? Probably. But... The Ravens and Ravens fans and players can't really complain about the decision he made because they didn't pay him the contract. They didn't give him the guaranteed money. So, and I I get it. He was asking for a lot. He wanted fully guaranteed and all this stuff. I think Lamar had reached a pay-him-whatever-he-wants contract. And we are at some point going to reach a time, I think sometime very soon, we're going to reach a point of the fully guaranteed quarterback contract, just like basketball contracts are guaranteed, baseball contracts are guaranteed. We are at some point going to reach that, and I think Lamar is smart to go for that. 
He's a 26-year-old MVP, one of the faces of the NFL. Like, the Ravens made the decision not to give him guaranteed money, and I think Lamar knows there was a re-injury risk. RG3 said it best himself. He went out there, put a brace on. It was so funny. Michael Vick says, put a brace on it. RG3 says, I put a brace on and it ended my career. I think Lamar knows that that's possible, and RG3 did that in a playoff game. I remember it. And he was not himself, and I think they still lost, right? So he knows that for Lamar. He knows this is a long-term, it's in the best long-term interest of Lamar, and it's probably in the best long-term interest of the Ravens, let's be honest. Was this team going to put it all together and go and win a Super Bowl this year with no wide receivers? Probably not. So I can't fault Lamar for putting his career first, especially when the Ravens didn't pay him the money. So that's really all I think about that. Then the second point is, is Lamar going to be back here? I still think yes. I think they will work it out. Did the the waters become murky here? Did they expect him to play? I don't know. I think Harbaugh knows that if they paid Lamar, he would have played in that game. Does that mean he faults Lamar for the decision or is mad at Lamar about it. I don't know. I think Harbaugh gets it. So I I still think there is a ton of mutual interest. I know Lamar loves the Ravens. I think there's a ton of mutual interest to get him back. They have a ton of time to get it done. I still think Lamar is back. But did this take me from like, I thought going into this week, maybe a 1% chance he hits free agency. Did it jump up to maybe 5%? Yeah. Yeah. Like, there's some weird stuff going on that I don't know all the details. Like, maybe there is bad blood in there. I I do know at this point he he is not playing on the franchise tag. This was his franchise tag season. He played on his fifth-year option willingly for his team. By the way, you cannot tell me... Like, that's, that's what pisses me off. Like, if anybody's, like, doubting that Lamar wants to win or that he cares about the Ravens... He knew that going into the year, this team had a chance to be special, and he played on a fifth-year option that he had no business playing on. So that narrative is stupid, but I still think he's back in Baltimore. And then we have to discuss, is he back in the same offense? And that's where Ravens fans just can't even comprehend the thought that maybe they could win a Super Bowl with Greg Roman. It is so fascinating to me to think about because we know the defense is, is I think, going to be there next year. It's all kind of come together late for them. Year two with this coordinator, Roquan extended. You've got some young defensive linemen that I think are ready to take a next step next year. Because if if you're going to run the Greg Roman offense, which is a, an option offense, it's a gimmick offense. It's funny. I, I used that term in 2019 when they won a, when Lamar won an MVP and they were the best offense in the league. I called it a gimmick offense. Ravens fans hated me. And now everybody uses that term because it is that is what it is. It is a different gimmick offense designed on fooling the defense, creating numbers advantages but it is all predicated on the threat of Lamar Jackson as a runner. And it amplifies Lamar's biggest strength as a passer, play action passes over the middle of the field to big bodies. So, you know, that team, when the the Roman offense was at its best, that team didn't have the defense that they have now or like that they're going to have now. And really what it is, is it is a high floor offense. You are a, you are going to control the ball. You're going to create a lot of sh- third and shorts. You're going to have extended drives. You're going to keep your defense fresh. And then they're going to come out and fly around, hopefully. If you can have a top five defense with a healthy version of a Greg Roman offense with Lamar, doing his thing on early downs with the with everything in place where now you have 
Charlie Kolar coming back healthy. He showed flashes. Isaiah Likely, Mark Andrews, J.K. Dobbins looks healthy. Your offensive line is in the best state it's been in in years going into next year. Ravens fans don't want to hear it, but you may just be a year away from the Greg Roman, Lamar, get Rashad Bateman back next year, maybe finally do get another receiver into the mix. Maybe this is a DeAndre Hopkins team to make, the, if you do get into third and long, make those more manageable for Lamar. I am just not so sure that taking this team that is built through the tight ends and taking Lamar, who, as I've always said, we just don't know if you have him run the Chiefs offense, the Bills offense, if you have him drop back 45, 50 times a game, we just don't know if he can be that level passer. I think he's shown enough to have doubts about that, but he's shown enough that you could get excited about that. But if you bring Lamar back here, I think they could have the best version of this offense since that MVP season for Lamar. Again, with Dobbins and Bateman and the old line now. And the best defense they've had. We just saw they were this close to beating the Bengals. This close. So that's that's a tough decision to make. I think they're on they are on a tightrope right now where they could fall one way. And that is keep Greg Roman, keep Lamar, keep this defense, fall into being one of the best teams in the NFL next year. They could also go the other way. If they, I mean, obviously, if if you get rid of Lamar, I just don't get where this team's going. That's why I just don't think he'll be going anywhere. Like, what else are the Ravens going to do? But if you get rid of Greg Roman, you're also risking that this offense... Is has a worse baseline, if that makes sense. You think this can be a, a consistently twenty four points a game, maybe more, and a great defense with a really good formula for winning playoff football. I don't know. I I can I I can understand going both directions, but. Uh, I don't think it's as easy as just get rid of Greg Roman and bring Lamar back. I think they know that. The Bengals, we didn't we didn't talk about the Bengals. Uh, This is what they were last year, right? Clutch defensive plays with Joe Burrow making some plays and um, you know using his feet. Burrow was great in this game, and the defense was great. And the play at the goal line saved their season. I don't know if they win that game without the 14-point swing. Tyler Huntley's trying to hurdle over the end zone. Ball gets popped out. Sam Hubbard returns it with really lousy blocking by his teammates, by the way. They were just running with him. Like, uh, I think it was Mark Andrews or somebody almost made that tackle. But um, you can't say that the Ravens for sure would have won if they convert that because it's not as simple as Oh, well, the Bengals scored on that play and the Ravens didn't. The score would have ended 24 to 17 Ravens. It's not that simple. You know, the Bengals obviously play things differently. They're playing to score and to win. So it's not as simple as, you know, Ravens win, Bengals lose if that play doesn't happen. So we know how clutch Joe Burrow is, but I. A great team win. Love this defense. Lou Anarumo continues to impress me. Joe Burrow continues to impress me, but I am worried about this offensive line, man. They are down three starters right now. And they're lucky that the Chiefs and Bills don't have amazing pass rushes, but they survived it last year. Can they do it again? God, that feels improbable. That just feels so improbable. Now, their defense is doing really special stuff. I'm excited to see what their game plan is for Buffalo. It's going to be a hell of a game. But I am worried about the offensive line right now. Joe Burrow was under siege in this game. Last game, Dallas at Tampa Bay. What else is is there to say other than Dak Prescott? I've been 
dog and Dak. I've been saying he's overrated. He's been playing like crap half the time throughout the last two months. And it's true. He's had some horrible games, Cowboys fans he has. Washington was ugly. Couple of ugly first half moments uh, in, in some other big games. Like, it's true. Dak was not playing well. Or at least not consistently well. And I've been saying since like week five, since he came back from the injury, I don't really care what he does during the regular season. I just want to see him in January playing like a $40 million quarterback. Because as I've been saying, this team is loaded. I still think the play calling is great. Kellen Moore was amazing in this game. So tired of Cowboys fans complaining about Kellen Moore's play calling. He's one of those guys that, you know, offensive coordinator narrative is so funny. Like if he leaves and there and you've got Mike McCarthy uh, with a bigger share in the offense, then we'll really see who's complaining about play calling. Um, but they've got a great team around him. It's not perfect. Like, you know, Michael Gallup hasn't been a number two guy this year. O lines had their ups and downs. It's Pretty damn good surrounding cast, though. Probably as good as it's going to get when you're paying your quarterback $40 million. And they have a defense that, after some hiccups the last few weeks, they showed up. Dan Quinn put together a great game plan, and they dominated this game start to finish. But Dak was relentless. And it was so funny. I was watching this on the airplane. Not that that's relevant, but... I think people were waiting on my Dak Prescott tweet, and I was like, God, I wish... I was like, is it really worth paying the the $6 just to tweet about how well Dak Prescott's playing? I'm like, no, I'll just wait till we land. But great way to great way to fly home, by the way. If you got a three-hour flight, which is Las Vegas back to Minneapolis, you got a live football game, pretty much from takeoff to landing. You just watch the game. Unreal. But... It, it, where was it? Oh, yeah. Aikman, former Cowboys quarterback. He's like, after two drives, he's like, yeah, Dak, Dak's not playing well. (laughs) Dak's just, he's reading the defense pretty slow. I'm like, huh? It was like, I don't know, two dropbacks. I I can't remember exactly what happened, but I didn't think he was making like egregious mistakes or missing huge reads or over overthrowing. Like, no, I think Tampa's defense had, had a good couple of plays on Dak I just thought it was funny the former you know Troy Aikman's biggest fear is probably Dak Prescott finishing his career as the best Cowboys quarterback ever so of course he's gonna take any small opportunity um but yeah Dak was a surgeon from start to finish and the Bucks they're gonna they're gonna heat you up they're gonna blitz they're gonna play press coverage they're gonna make you make tough decisions and he was just a surgeon man he was so comfortable getting through his reads, the touchdown where he's scanning the whole field. He hits the seam to the tight end. Just so many big third downs where he just he stood in there. The other thing is he was running around. He was using his legs. He had a huge scramble. He had the touchdown, throwing on the run. It's everything Dak hasn't been doing. He avoided mistakes is a big thing. Like, he led, led the freaking league in interceptions this year. Yeah, you know, he, a lot of them weren't his fault. Like I said, he was top eight in highest turnover worthy play percentage this year. Not in this game, man. He was awesome. So I have nothing down. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. I've been saying all year, it's a put up or shut up season for Dak Prescott. And finally in a playoff game, I think he played maybe the, was that the best game of his career? I mean, it was the, it was the first time in a long time that I've watched Dak Prescott play and felt like he was unstoppable. There's been times where him within the offense has felt unstoppable, but it's not like, you know, Pollard wasn't doing anything amazing. CD was good, but like he wasn't mossing dudes or creating crazy run after catch. There wasn't any big giant screen completions or schemed up offense. This was Dak being a great quarterback in January football. You love to see it. So, a tip of the cap. I'm I'm gonna back off of the Dak is overrated talk. Now he's got to play the Niners defense. I I I did say I think getting to the NFC Championship is a minimum for them. 
I think if Dak plays like this, they can get there, but at least we've seen it. If he goes against the Niners defense and they lose in San Fran and they force a couple mistakes, that's a pretty freaking nasty group to go against. So I'm going to back off the Dak is overrated talk for the foreseeable future Cowboys fans. Uh, And then the Tampa Bay era is done, right? It's over. Tom is not going to retire. I do not think so. Feel very confident in saying that. He's not coming back to to Tampa Bay, though. This thing has kind of ran its course. I think the defense is getting old. And we all underrated the loss of Bruce Arians because Leftwich was a head coach candidate. Bowles is a great defensive coordinator. Tom Brady's there. We know he's going to call a lot of the shots. You know, Tom Brady didn't call enough shots this year. He didn't, when he took over the offense, when they were in those two minute situations, hurry up and he's calling the plays, that's when they were at their best. But the, the anemic run game that lacked any creativity whatsoever, the overemphasis on screens, it was a horribly designed offense. And, Bruce Arians is an offensive guru. He just is. Carson Palmer had his best year. Tom Brady's been great under him. Like, Bruce Arians is such an underappreciated coach at this point. And I don't know what led to him kind of taking a seat back there, but a back seat there. But I think Tom, Tom maybe didn't realize that he needed Bruce Arians a little more than he did. But that, that loss was clearly huge. And it, it's run its course. I think he's going to go probably to the Raiders. It just, I can see it. I can already picture him thrown to Devontae Adams back with, back with um, his offensive coordinator. Why can't I think of his name? Head coach. Yikes. Anyway, great weekend of football. I'm going to take a break here. Take Teddy in for a haircut. He's well overdue. Wish I could show you if you're uh, watching the video version. Uh, So I'll be back uh, in my time in like an hour to discuss the coaching carousel. All right, so we got the coaching carousel conversation now and going to be shorter this year because last year (laughs) there was, it was either nine or 11 New head coaches last year, a lot of crazy moves, a lot of really attractive head coach openings. This year, you know, Panthers, Cardinals, Texans, Colts, and Broncos. Not the most attractive spots. And we've already seen one of the best candidates in Ben Johnson, offensive coordinator for the Detroit Lions, who actually, when I made this list yesterday, was number one at the top. And then the news came out that he wants to come back. Um, you know, he already said, I'm good. I'm going to be an offensive coordinator in Detroit again. I think he looked at some of these teams and he's like, I think there might be better opportunities for me next year. So it doesn't mean it's a less interesting conversation. In fact, in a lot of ways, it makes it more complicated that some of these spots are less desirable. But first off, I'm going to go through my list of kind of top candidates, a little bit about them. And then I'm going to go team by team for each opening and and try to fill in what makes the most sense and and what we might end up seeing. So with Ben Johnson gone, I think the number one find, the the number one most desirable candidate to me is Shane Steichen. Is Shane Steichen, the offensive coordinator for the Philadelphia Eagles. And he took over the play calling late last season and into this year has been their play caller. And outside of like San Francisco and Miami, I think Philadelphia has had some of the best play calling in the year uh, on the year for any team. The way that they use Jalen hurts is just brilliant. It's a lot of spread concepts, shotgun RPOs, read option. Like they've done a great job of balancing what hurts can do as a runner without being over lenient on it. Like say, the Ravens are. And for a lot of these teams, tapping into a quarterback's rushing ability is going to be valuable, especially for a team maybe like Arizona with Kyler Murray 
comes to mind there. A couple of former Oklahoma quarterbacks. So that's a little teaser there. But I think he's a brilliant play caller. He's He's got a good scheme that can work. And I don't know a ton about him as a leader. I know he's younger. But to me, getting that up and ascending offensive mind is always going to be the utmost importance for any organization. And that's just a point I should make. If you haven't heard me say this before, I am always personally going to put a higher value on offensive head coaches because it's not that it's not that a defensive head coach can't be great because they can, but you need a great play caller to pair with you and a great offensive coordinator to run the offense. And as we've seen around the league, the second you get that guy, he's gone. So like long term, it can be beneficial to have an offensive-minded head coach that is overseeing the offense. But that said, my second most desirable head coach candidate is going to be D'Amico Ryans, the defensive coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers. I have been blown away with the scheme he has put together. And yes, they have Nick Bosa and a lot of talent on that unit. But you talk about the league being a quarters too high league right now the Niners are able to live in that world without the same downsides that we see with teams like Minnesota Green Bay Cleveland and it it was existent with the Jets defense as well that was really you know D'Amico and and Robert Salah are, are kind of two peas in a pod schematically but the way they stunt guys up up front and they can create pressure with four guys scheme guys open. It's just brilliant. And then they'll play bl- uh, press coverage on third down. They'll mix up their zones. They just really run the scheme that I would want I would want any defense to run in the league. I think it is the modern what should be the modern meta is the perfect blend of don't give up the big play, but find ways to stay aggressive up front as well. And I, I just love it. I also I also think from a leadership perspective, he might be the best guy on this list, at least kind of like a raw, raw guy that can, I, I'm not going to say he's the, like a Dan Campbell sort of, but like, I think he, the way he just his, his personality, he just exudes this energy that I think is contagious to his defense. So D'Amico Ryans, I would think is a lock to be a head coach somewhere, unless he just really likes being a defensive coordinator. Then of course, Sean Payton and, Sean Payton is probably number one on this list, but he comes with a caveat. You got to trade for him. So that's that does make things very interesting because if you are a team with a top 10 pick, do you want to give that pick up for a, what is he, 62? How old is Sean Payton? 59, so he's not 60 yet. He will be 60. Yeah, it's irrelevant. But a 60-year-old head coach who hasn't shown he can win without Drew Brees. I mean, he that's not fair. He's a great coach. But if you're giving up a top 10 pick for that, I don't know. I don't know. We we know who Sean Payton is, though. He'd be a great acquisition. I'd probably be excited for any team that did it. But if you're the Texans and you give up what is it? What is the Browns pick? The eighth pick or the ninth pick? Do you really want to give that up for Sean Payton? What if he hates it there and he retires next year? You know, that's a lot. But overall, he's towards the top of my list. Sean Payton is fantastic. Then you have Frank Reich. I thought he got a bad beat in Indianapolis, where the owner kind of goes off the rails. The quarterback situation clearly was not ideal. I just think Frank Reich is one of the 32 best head coaches in the league. And he's an offensive mind. I think he's done a lot with a Colts team that just, I mean, look at them after he left. I I just, I I don't look at that roster over the last four years and I'm like, oh, they should have done more than what Frank Reich accomplished. I, I really think he got a bad beat. Anyone would be lucky to have him. Is he ever going to be the best head coach in the NFL? Maybe not, but to me, he should be coaching in the NFL. Then you have a couple of younger offensive minds. Mike Kafka with the Giants. 
who I think they've done an, a brilliant job scheming up offense, especially early in the year with no talent. And Ken Dorsey also comes from now the Brian Dable tree in Buffalo. So just a couple more offensive minds there that would run kind of the Brian Dable style offense, which involves a lot of quarterback design runs, pushing the ball downfield with deep crossers. Love that scheme for for various quarterbacks. Another hot name is Ajero Evero, defensive coordinator in Denver, who did a great job with that defense this year. He turned down the interim head coach job there, knowing how big of a mess it was. But he is definitely going to be a hot name, whether he's hired as a defensive coordinator somewhere or a head coach. But he's kind of just out on the market right now because Denver's going through a coaching change. And then lower on my list, higher on a lot of bigger lists for me is Dan Quinn. I just think there's such a ceiling with a retread defensive coordinator. I also think Dan Quinn, you know, I'm kind of second guessing this. He did not get the most out of that Falcons defense when he was their defensive coordinator, their head coach. But I also think he's done a lot of learning since then. I think he was a Seattle cover three guy through and through. And the scheme just didn't work in Atlanta. They didn't have the guys that he had with the Legion of Boom to run Seattle 3. In Dallas, he has completely changed what he's able to do schematically. He's been excellent at drawing up stunts and blitzing and goes more man coverage. He has earned another opportunity as a head coach, I think, in the right spot. With a good offensive coordinator, it could work again. But I was just so underwhelmed by the Dan Quinn era in Atlanta that I couldn't get overly excited, but I think he'd be fine. And then you got Jonathan Gannon is like a popular name as well. They had an incredible roster in Philadelphia. He also kind of comes from this Fangio system. He He's a little bit more creative than your, your Joe Barry's and your Ed Donatell's and your Joe Woods's. I think he's got a better balance for, for certain stuff, and they they're more effective at designing stunts even though they don't run them very often but i don't know i'm not sold on jonathan cannon quite yet and then the last guy on my list is kellen moore who i actually probably should have put ahead of jonathan gannon kellen moore is interesting to me because you know cowboys fans hate him they hate kellen moore they think he's the like a bottom three play caller in the league he's not he's a top 12 play caller in the league i firmly believe that but is he a leader of men type? Is he a head coach type? That He's just so young. He's like 34. He's barely been into coaching. I know he's he's been growing. And I know I had Mike Kafka higher on my list, but I don't know. I I guess that's all I have to say on Kel Moore. I think he's a, he's a good candidate, but is he a leader of men? I, I don't know. You'd have to prove that. So for... The first team we're going to talk about is the Carolina Panthers. And to me, this is probably the most attractive head coach position. It's between them and the Cardinals. You know, I think the Panthers got a, got a high draft pick. They've got, should have some cap space to work with. I think you have a lot to work with in general, though. You have a lot of defensive talent on the roster. You've got a really nice looking offensive line. You got a number one wide receiver in DJ Moore. But you do have to figure out the quarterback situation, right? So I think they can go in a lot of different directions. I think the direction they're going to want to go is the young offensive coordinator type. Though now that Ben Johnson has been wiped off the market, does that change their thought process here? They have that route, which I think is, is their preferred route, is can they get Shane Steichen? and build, you know, pair him potentially with a quarterback in this draft and go that route. I think they also interviewed Mike Kafka. Could be an option as well. Like, I I would like that route for them. I like that route for anybody. The young ascending offensive coordinator, it's been a formula for success for a lot of teams around the league. But they do feel like a team that could go in a few different directions. I think they, they probably are not a Sean Payton destination. I don't know if the Saints would want to send him to a division rival. Maybe they would. 
But I do think this could make sense as a Frank Reich destination to kind of stabilize things, get an adult in the room, steer the ship, and also oversee the offense. I would I would love Frank Reich here. Does he want this job, though, where he's right back to needing to find a quarterback? It's possible that he's like, nah, I'm just going to sit this one out until a, a job comes open where I get a quarterback. But I think he would he would do a good job there. And then the, the third route for them is to stick with their current defensive coordinator that stepped in as the interim head coach in um, Steve Wilkes. He's loved in that locker room. This is one thing that just is always, I guess, bothered me a little bit is, is when you have a good interim coach, teams very rarely are able to retain that guy. And I think it's because there would be some weird vibes. Like, what if the head coach wasn't good, and then the interim coach was like, but I did a good job, and you didn't hire me. It could be some bad blood there, but... Steve Wilkes has been a defense uh, has been a head coach before. Now he got done pretty dirty in Arizona, one and done with Josh Rosen. It just yuck. Like he didn't really have a chance there. So I like Steve Wilkes, and I think he deserves another chance. But again, the defensive coordinator, the retread defensive coordinator. What's the ceiling there? If you fire, if you get a good offensive coordinator, is he going to be gone right away? It's just a harder way to go. But it's an option for them. They are they are certainly a team that could go in any direction here, I think. Then the Arizona Cardinals are the next opening. And to me, this is, I hinted at this earlier, but Shane Steichen here would be perfect. He could plug the exact same offense in with Kyler Murray. Does such a good job with the RPO game, the read option game, enough early down stuff that makes third downs more manageable. I think he's been just entirely creative in the run game in general. He could be plug and play in Arizona's offense and solve a lot of their issues. That said, this has been a very soft team, a team that hasn't had a lot of mental toughness or discipline. Does the owner, because they kind of did that with the last hire. They went Cliff Kingsbury, was a risky, offensive-minded head coach. Does the owner, Bidwell, does he say, you know what, I think we need to restore some toughness to this team and go with more of the defensive route? And I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea. Now, the thing is, Vance Joseph did a really good job with this defense. And you never made him an interim head coach or anything so there's not really a whole lot of bad blood as long as he likes this team and wants to stay as defensive coordinator that's why i prefer going the offensive route but what i'm getting at here is there's a couple defensive minds that would make a lot of sense here number 1 of course is Demico Ryan's can you poach him from the Niners who by the way um because of the new rule for minority hires it, when Demico Ryan's gets a head coach the Niners already had an assistant GM get hired in Tennessee who was a minority. So the Niners could have, so they traded away for Christian McCaffrey, right? They could recoup all of that, basically. Four third-round picks over the next two years for minority hires. That's the way you do it, man. Um, that's amazing. And I think it's going to happen. But anyway, D'Amico Ryans here would be a big influx of physicality, right? But he does not have the defensive talent to step in and work with that he had in Arizona. So, you know, roster talent's a big part of success for a defensive coordinator. And would that work? I'm not quite as sure. I would much rather keep Vance Joseph, who did about as good of a job as you could ask from any coordinator, and go the offensive route. And that's why it's it's definitely a perfect spot for Shane Steichen or even a Mike Kafka uh, but Kafka feels a little bit too close to Cliff Kingsbury <laughs> as a head coach in a lot of ways. But uh, this could also be a Sean Payton destination. We know Sean Payton has shown that he can get very creative with the quarterback run stuff as well with what he did with Taysom Hill. It's If it costs you a first-round pick, though, that's very valuable resource to improve the roster. Can you get him for a second-round pick? Maybe. 
But I do think this this would probably be the most successful destination for Sean Payton. I think. So Pay- Payton and and Shane Steichen would be my top two for Arizona. But there is one more name that I haven't even mentioned yet that I think this would be a unique fit, and that is defensive coordinator for Tennessee, Shane Bowen. Bowen. Obviously, it's it's hard to know exactly what he's done because Vrabel kind of oversees that defense, but the Cardinals just hired Monty Ossifort from Tennessee to be their to be their GM. So there is a some bit of a relationship there uh, to kind of if you want to go the Tennessee Vrabel toughness route and try to replicate that culture, which is not a bad route to go, maybe. That's a nice little duo there to bring Shane Bowen over to Arizona. So another team that could go in a few different directions. These next teams are a little bit less attractive and and less routes they can go. So the Houston Texans, they've been kind of a pit of despair. And I think that job's becoming a little bit more attractive. They've got two high first-round picks. They seem seem to have some nice young talent on the roster. You get a guy like John Mechie back next year. Could be a nice kind of free extra pick in a way. But I still don't think if you're a coach who wants to get a, like, like Ben Johnson, for example. I think he was like, I have no interest in going to be the Texans head coach. It's too risky. I want a better job. If this is going to be my first run at things, I want to wait for the perfect opportunity. But there might be some older coaches, retread opportunities that are a step up from what they've been able to land the last couple of years because they've been a complete joke, right? Well, at least now they have the number two pick in the draft, probably going to be getting a quarterback finally. So some of the names I look at are your kind of older retread guys like Dan Quinn staying in Texas. Leslie Frazier for the Buffalo Bills. Does he want a second run as a head coach after some good years in Buffalo? Lou Anarumo for the Bengals, who's done a great job with that roster. And I also wouldn't rule out Sean Payton here either. But I think for Payton, he knows it would be a little bit of a rebuild for him. But to me, when I look at the Texans, I think veteran guy that doesn't have his whole life ahead of him to sit around and wait for a better opportunity. I think this will be an older head coach from that list of names I just went through. Then you have the Indianapolis Colts. And this is unattractive because of how far off the rails the owner has gone. And it makes it very complicated to try and predict what they're going to do even. I mean, they were thinking about maybe keeping Jeff Saturday. But another situation where like someone like Ben Johnson or Kafka or Kellen Moore or Shane Steichen, do you want to leave and go work for that owner without a quarterback? That's a pretty tough sell. So they're kind of in a similar spot with the Texans where it's probably going to be from that same list. Dan Quinn. Like, definitely, a, I can definitely see Sean Payton in Indianapolis. Just that last name carries a lot of weight. Payton running the Colts again. I can picture it. And I think Sean Payton has the ego and the the resume to step in and be like, why can't I think of... I keep drawing a blank on the Colts owner's name for some reason. Um, Ursay. I don't know why I couldn't think of that. But, you know, Peyton, I think this this probably makes the most sense now that I'm really thinking about this. I, but do you have to give up your first-round pick? And then what are you doing at the quarterback situation? Are you Are you – Trading a second round pick for Derek Carr? I don't know. That that's why the Sean Payton thing just complicates all this. But if it's not Payton, it can't be Ben Johnson. Do they try to restore the defense with D'Amico Ryans? I think this defense could be quite nasty with D'Amico Ryans. I think that'd be an excellent hire. 
that D line is is very similar in a lot of ways. I think to some of the pieces he's worked with. Can definitely see some parallels between DeForest. I mean, he he literally had DeForest Buckner right a couple of years ago. So reunite those guys. I think that that would be a great destination. And then, of course, if you can attract a young offensive coordinator, a Steichen, Kafka, Kellen Moore, I like that too. But I would say for the Colts, the two most likely at this point would be D'Amico Ryans or Sean Payton. And then we have the Denver Broncos is our last spot here. Another kind of messy situation because of the Russell Wilson situation. Russ obviously did not look like old Russ. I do think at the end of the year, he showed that he can still play. I think Russ can still be a top half quarterback in the league. Can he play up to the contract that they paid him at this point? That seems a little bit doubtful. But I also think Russ has a bit of a... I don't always like saying he's got an ego because he's a good guy at the core. Like, I don't, I don't think he means anybody harm. I think he is giving and cares about people, but I think he's a, he's, he's a personality. He's someone you got to work with. He, he has a certain expectation that he's going to be treated as a superstar and you're going to build the offense around him. And it's kind of the same thing. Pete Carroll was just kind of done with Pete Carroll's like, I'm the CEO, everybody here needs to do what I say, and he didn't like that, and a lot of coaches won't like that. And I think a guy like Sean Payton, for example, might not like that. Or like Jim Harbaugh, if he were to go there, and and Harbaugh's off the board now too. So it it needs to be the right fit, and that's kind of why I think they might go more the route of a defensive coach, because then... It's kind of Russ and the offensive coordinator are in charge of the offense, and then the defensive coordinator runs the team in the defense. Like, I think as far as like leadership structure and continuity, I I think there were some issues there, some clash between what Hackett wanted to do and what Russ wanted. I think it's best if the guy in the guy who draws up the offense that's in charge of the offense, I'm not saying find a dud, but I think it's best that that guy isn't the head coach. (laughs) I think you probably go with a defensive-minded head coach. So D'Amico Ryans would be a ton of fun here. I I think he is just the ideal defensive mind. And this honestly might not be a bad Dan Quinn spot. There's These two guys, uh, Dan Quinn has been tied to Denver for a long time. And I actually think that could work where you go Dan Quinn and then you find an offensive mind. I don't know exactly who that's going to be. But Dan Quinn, for for what it's worth, I do think, and there's a connection there, right? Dan Quinn was with Russ in Seattle way back in the day. So there is a connection there as well. But I, I think Dan Quinn is a really chill coach. Like, I think players really like him. I think that would, if there was a leadership issue in the locker room, I think that could work. So that's really what I'm thinking for Denver. I don't see I don't see these young offensive minds wanting to go tie the the beginning of their head coaching careers to where Russell's at right now. I just I think and and Denver themselves tried that last year with Hackett and it didn't work. So I think though a lot usually teams go the other way. So I, I would say either Ryan's or or Dan Quinn. And I just don't know if Ajero Evero is interested in that job. If he is, he would be another great candidate. He obviously did a great job with them last year, so throw him into the mix there. But there's your coaching carousel, and that is the end of today's podcast. So thank you for watching. If you are watching this clip on YouTube, on my main YouTube, go check out the full show where we broke down the wildcard weekend games. And if you are listening to the main podcast, thank you for listening. Again, I'm going to have a mailbag edition of the podcast uh, later in the week. So if you're on Patreon, get those questions in. Hopefully we can have a, a nice show, 20, 30 questions, and get through them all. But this has been the Fully Inflated Football Podcast. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for listening. Leave a review if you've got a chance. And we'll see you soon. Peace out. Peace out.